Right, so today I'm going to talk about this paper I wrote two years ago during COVID, mm. stuck at home. Uh, it's called Degeneration Entropy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, based on the paper. This paper was written for a workshop, uh, this masterclass that LSD organized actually two years ago by uh, some grad students. Uh, the topic was to sort of explore how if there were any open threads left behind by Lakatosh, uh, and I sort of came across the proofs and reputation then, and I got really excited and interested in the topic. So um, today I'm gonna sort of uh, propose an account of a uh, degeneration of like the uh, of uh, concepts based on or inspired by maybe uh, Lakatosh's proofs and reputations, uh, the 1976, uh, 2015 version, with two criteria, uh, superfluity and authoritarianism. And this account, I think, is uh, distinct from, but can augment the account of degeneration and progress in the MSRP, uh, doesn't relate specifically to the empirical content of the con uh, concept of theory, but to their methodological aspects. I would have time to talk about this per se, but it's in the, uh, I left it behind. If we can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested. And finally, I'm going to apply this uh, account of degeneration to a case study in the recent history of concept entropy, again entropy, uh, specifically the introduction of uh, information theoretic and subjective uh, notions of, uh, into the concept entropy, uh, especially by James, uh, 1957, uh, to, uh, and to argue that this transition was degenerate in the sense I will make more precise. Hmm. So firstly, I'll talk about what degeneration is, uh, starting from Lakatosh's proofs and reputations, and I'll try to extract two criteria uh, one from the main text and one kind of from the appendix A, which I know it's like incomplete or you know it's so it's a bit, bit more exploratory. But I do think there's something interesting that we talk about. So I'm going to uh, extract these two criteria and I'll apply it to entropy to sort of an analyze and uh, evaluate that concept. So and, uh, we've talked about it quite a lot today already, but you know, like I'll just view it as like a sort of pattern of mathematical discovery or the growth of informal theories. Uh, I will use theory and concept kind of interchangeably. You can kind of uh, be more pedantic with me in the Q and A if you want. Um, I'm given by the stages of heuristic growth in the heuristic style. So there's a huge heuristic style which is the non-degenerate, uh, I think, uh, on Lakatos's view, and this thing called the deductivist style, which which is degenerate. So he says, and I think in the appendix, uh, you know, the style carries the proof-generated uh, definitions of their proof ancestors, presents them out of the blue in an artificial and authoritarian way. Right, so it hides the global counterexample that led to discovery. Basically, you're tearing apart a concept from its uh, historical trajectory and just presenting that thing on its own. Right. So on the on the other hand, the good heuristic style, whatever that might be, emphasizes the problem situation, which uh, is the sort of the logic which he says he uses in like an informal way usually, uh, which gave rise to the new concept. So uh, one example he talks about in the book a lot, and we talked about it just now as well during the Phillips talk. Uh, Lakatosh's example, which is generalizing the Euler characteristics or the notion of a polyhedra, and I think someone was asking just now as well as lines, vertices, edges, where we are sort of twisting and like uh, stretching these concepts. But you know, uh, my, I want to start with this uh, quote by Alpha, which is one of the students in the Proofs and Reputations, who says, "Wow, isn't this what a mir miraculous unfolding of the hidden riches of the trivial starting point? <laughs> where we start from one vertex, it's one vertex, and then we just so just." Go on, and we end up with this like super general that things that applies to it's like almost certainly true, right? Normal and steroid polyhedra, which basically means uh, polyhedrons with multiple connected faces and with cavities inside them. We can count all of them with the k's and the j's, and then we get a really nice uh, sort of generalization. So, uh, data in response to this, which is like, has Alpha lost all his judgment? You know, one starts with a problem, not with a birth. Right? So that's uh, the, first, the first one. And then uh, Ro says, well, this last two, right, especially these two, is, he says, uh, the generalizations to normal and spherical polyhedra. So basically trying to make your conjecture about the Euler characteristic true, as, as opposed to finding more exciting counterexamples to the notion of the more uh, sort of intuitive notion of the Euler characteristic. It's, uh, it's cheap, right? This is a cheap generalization. And Gamma goes on to say, well, these two are not growth, but degeneration. Uh, instead of going to these two, I'll rather go and find some exciting counter examples to the original Euler characteristic, which is a uh, d minus d plus n equals two. But what is degeneration? Uh, it's not so obvious in the PNR, I think, uh, even though it does seem to play some evaluative role in evaluating the growth of concepts uh, and the transitions of concepts. So I'll try to extract two criteria for degeneration here from the PNR. It's very exploratory, but I think these are two uh, heuristics we can rely on to evaluate the degeneration of a concept when it's transitioning. So firstly, I'll start with this criteria called superfluidity. 
Uh, I'm not sure how to like make a, a noun out of superfluous, but I I call it superfluity. Um, gamma describes seven as a pointless degenerate uh, generalization, right? But who cares about making something true? Something like the your know, other characteristics you know, with all these generalizations for polyhedra. Uh, it's not hedra. Hedra with uh, cavities or multiply connected faces. That wasn't what we set out with. We were interested in the original, just an intuitive notion of a uh, of polyhedra. And you know, of course, we can stretch it a bit, and then at some point, gamma says it's too far. We have gone too far. We, it's not interesting anymore. It serves only for making up complicated, pretentious formulas for nothing. <laughs> and what is the use of all this precision? Uh, precision? Stop this flood of pretentious trivialities. Some might say this applies to modern analytic metaphysics as well. Right. So it is to put it bluntly, generalization for the sake of generalization. In other words, when a concept is extended in order to encompass new cases, but they were not uh, sort of relevant to the original problem situation or the heuristics that followed, uh, Gamma considered them trivial uh, extensions. So to build on this idea, uh, there's a footnote by Lekatosh, we quote Polia saying, um, shallow cheap generalization is more fashionable nowadays than it was formerly. It dilutes a little idea with big terminology. The author, you know, maybe I, that's what I'm doing here, right? With super fluidity. Uh, the author <laughs> usually prefers to take even that little idea from someone else, like me. Uh, refrains from adding any original observation and avoids solving any problem except a few problems arising from the difficulties <laughs> of his own terminology. It would be easy to quote examples, but I don't antagonize people. <laughs> and another of the greatest mathematicians of our century, uh, John von Neumann, also warned against this danger of degeneration. So again, degeneration shows up here. But he thought it wouldn't be so bad if the discipline was under the influence of men with an exceptionally well-developed taste. So with taste, we might be able to rule out degeneration. Though Lagatosh uh, in footnotes does express uh, skepticism that this like true. So here I want to extract the criteria of uh, superfluity, that is, degeneration is tied uh, to cheap gen generalizations or adding unnecessary terminology in the process of developing a concept or theory. So generalization of a concept to new domains without justification or respect of the background problem situation, what we cared about initially when we came up with the original initial conjecture, the primitive conjecture, and that kind of stuff, is superfluous and only adds unnecessary terminology, pretentious formula, and confusion. So I'll call this first criterion superfluity. And the second criterion want to extract is authoritarianism. So in Lakatosh's view, there's something problematic about the deductivist style of simply defining concepts out of thin air without appropriately uh, defining or situating them within their problem situation without presenting the heuristics that led to this concept. So something like uh, what we saw just now, one to seven, if we just present it to you like that, like what I did, you might be like, well, what, what's going on? Where did it come from, right? So it's kind of, kind of the same feeling here. You feel like I'm, I'm being a part here in here, right? <laughs> As a speaker, I'm forcing you to sort of, uh, accept all this without uh, uh, understanding why they came up to be the case. And like Lagatosh like says in the appendix, right, one can easily give more examples while uh, we're stating the primitive conjecture, showing the proofs, the counter examples, and then the heuristic order up to the theorem, the proof generated the definition, this long history of the concept uh, would dispel the authoritarian mysticism of abstract mathematics and would act as a break on degeneration. So degeneration shows up again here. A couple of case studies in this degeneration would do much good for mathematics. Unfortunately, the deductivist style and the atomization of mathematical knowledge protects degenerate papers to a considerable degree. And he discusses the case of Rudin's, uh, or maybe Rudin, uh, discussion of uh, bounded variation, and this thing called the Riemann uh, style, style ES, right? Steel ES, uh, it figure in his uh, textbook. Basically, it really proves a theorem to the fact that you know, this specific function, called the function of bounded variation, satisfying other criteria, is also a member of this class of integral functions. Now, Lekatos excuses uh, Rudin of failing to explain, as I did, uh, why the Riemann steel yes integral was important or relevant to begin with, and why we should care about it in the notion of bounded variation. So now we have this theorem, according to Lekatosh, in which two mystical concepts, bounded variation and Riemann integrability, occur, but two mysteries do not add up to understanding. Or perhaps they do for those who have the ability and inclination to pursue an abstract train of thought. And in the footnote to this claim, Lekatosh notes that Rudin does mention this, but in a way that was entirely disconnected from the two aforementioned concepts. So it was hidden in exercise in a different chapter. So if you wanted to understand why these two things showed up, you have to go and read this other thing in the bottom. So I've been told by a anonymous reviewer that only someone with no brain would like, uh, just jump into Rudin without understanding any other mathematics. I'm not sure if that's uh, Lagatosh's point, but uh, yeah. So you know, he declares, uh, Lagatosh, uh, that this, the two concepts introduced this way were introduced in an authoritarian way. Right? Uh, you just 
come up with these two concepts and you just like sort of prove theorems of them, but you never say why they're important or why they were formulated the way they were. So a heuristic presentation would show that both concepts, these two concepts here, are proof-generated concepts originating in and one of uh, in one and the same proof, which is Dirichlet's uh, Dirichlet's, Dirichlet's proof of the Fourier conjecture, and this proof gives the following background of both concepts. So uh, for him, he thinks that we need to sort of go back to the original root when we are presenting this uh, uh, concept, so that especially in the textbook, in this pedagogical case, so that people can understand where these concepts come from, and we can sort of uh, absorb it or deprive these uh, two concepts of their authoritarian magic. <laughs> and their origins can be traced to some clear-cut problem situation and to the criticisms of previously attempted solutions of these problems. So I have this uh, extract another criteria for degeneration here, authoritarianism. So uh, on my view, I think the way I frame it, a concept or terminology, definition, theory, right? When you're stretching and developing a, a, a thing, a concept, you're employing it without not only without justification, but with the further fact that it needs no justification. You're just putting it there and you think this is fine, right? So the concept is used with the attitude that this is the correct true definition without qualification, and importantly ignoring the problem situation. So I understand authoritarianism specifically as introducing concepts without adequate specification of the problem situations and heuristics that led us to these concepts, alongside an attitude that this specification is in fact unneeded, maybe implicitly, not explicitly, sometimes. So this brings us to entropy. So uh, one thing I want to sort of clarify is that some, some uh, you might think, oh, you know, like the, uh, the proofs and reputation is all about math, right? So why do we think that I'm just apply it to a scientific concept like entropy? So I want to, uh, I guess a quote from Lekachos might help here, where he thinks that mathematical heuristic and scientific heuristic are very much alike, not because both are inductive, but because both are characterized by this thick idea of conjectures, proofs and reputation. Uh, Jennifer's talk just now kind of suggests that there is a more overlap than we think, and the important difference maybe lies in the nature of the respective conjectures, proofs, or he says in science explanations, and counterexamples. So I'm going to apply the two concepts I have uh, here, uh, authoritarianism and uh, superfluity, uh, to analyze one important shift in the concept of entropy, uh, the incorporation of information theoretic uh, notions into entropy by genes. In particular, I want to evaluate the degeneration and the transition from entropy as a thermodynamic physical concept about physical systems to information theoretic subjective uh, concept about ignorance or partial knowledge about physical systems. So why entropy? I think it's because entropy, uh, I guess for some people, still is a, a physically unclear uh, concept, partly because all these different things are called entropy nowadays, and it just gets harder and harder to figure out what exactly the relationship between them is, or whether there is a difference. So this is a quote that's kind of helpful, even though I don't fully agree with it, but I think it's kind of uh, fun as a quote, right? As a young man, I tried to read thermodynamics, but I always came up against entropy as a brick wall that stopped my further progress found the ordinary mathematical explanation of costs. Right? It's just a, a definition. But no sort of physical idea underlying it. No other seemed to even try to give any physical idea. Having in those days a great respect for textbooks, I concluded that the physical meaning must be so obvious that it needs no explanation, and that I was especially <laughs> stupid on a particular subject. Maybe you know, there's something there about how people talk about entropy. And another case of famous a quote, but I've you know, been think, trying to figure out whether he actually said it, and it seems like it's not so clear. So let's take it as an apocryphal kind of quote. Right? My greatest concern was what to call it. Right? I thought uh, this is a cloud channel. I thought calling it information, but the word was so overly used, so I decided to call it uncertainty. And when I discussed it with John von Neumann, he had a better idea. Von Neumann told me, you should just call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function, roll on roll, has already been used in statistical mechanics under that name. And the second place, and more importantly, no one knows what entropy really is, so in a debate you'll always have the <laughs> right? So this kind of a uh, well-known quote, uh, like, you know, I'm not sure if it's really by, he really said it, later on he said he never said it, so. <laughs> and so I'm going to focus on entropy, and specifically I'm going to focus on James's version of entropy, uh, James's introduction of information theory into entropy. Uh, so why that? Why is that the case? Um, because uh, I think James is the sort of one of the earliest person, I think not the first one, I think the first one was uh, Leon Brion, 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 uh, I doubt that there, uh, but I think that James is the one that really influenced the field. 
So as uh, Simon Felia says, I doubt there is a more staunch defender of the generality of entropy as a basis for quantifying uncertainty than the physicist E.T. James. So high praise for him. And Blankenstein of Blankenstein Hawking Entropy uh, for black holes, uh, thermodynamics, also credits James for connecting statistical mechanics to information theory. So he basically says, well, you know, this was already, this connection between information and statistical mechanics was proved by, uh, by James. And later on, Hawking does the same when he says, well, you know, when stuff goes into the black hole, we lose information, and, you know, that's what, therefore entropy has decreased. So all these connections to information, between information and black holes are kind of the spawn out of uh, James's paper. So before we get into James's actual work, uh, let's try to clarify or like what I think the problem situation is. And if you disagree or you think of a different problem situation, the evaluation might be different. So for me, the, uh, prior to James, I think the problem situation is about explaining or justifying statistical mechanics or interpreting it. The Gibson approach is by far, was by far, and probably is still by far the dominant approach to that statistical, statistical mechanics. And the Gibbs entropy is here, a roll on roll, where uh, integral over gra gamma, where gamma is the space phase of the physical system, x is a point, and then you have your measure, and you have a distrib uh, probability distribution over the phase space, right, that evolves with time. Or it doesn't involve it, it's the equilibrium. Right? So uh, SG, or Gibbs entropy, in turn, the roll on roll which you just saw, is supposed to match the thermodynamic entropy at the thermodynamic limit, which justifies definition and then provides a physical basis for using it. Just as the change in thermodynamic entropy tracks the reversibility and irreversibility of thermodynamical processes, being equal to zero for reversible ones and greater, for zero, greater than zero for irreversible ones, uh, so does uh, the Gibbs entropy at the appropriate thermodynamic limit where the number of particles go to infinity while keeping the number over the volume the way around, uh, constant. Right. So the approach so far is physical and oriented. This is the tradition we, 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 live, uh, we were living in, I guess. Um, so in particular, the probability distributions depend on the physical state of the system uh, in pretty determine, of course, together with the dynamics of the system. And nothing in the Gibson theory so far forces us to employ notions of ignorance, knowledge so far. I'm not talking about subjectivity at all. Right? It's just probabilities. Now, of course, you can interpret probabilities in a subjective way you want to, but nothing's forcing you to do it, or, in this, or it's an open question, right? And nothing really empirically forces you to interpret it as a subject. And I think this lines up well with the, what the founders of StatMag intended to do, just to, to understand the molecular foundations of thermodynamics and to interpret thermodynamics in terms of molecular mechanics. Right, so for example, Boltzmann here says, I will be proof in the following that the mechanical analogy between the facts on which the second law is based and the statistical laws of motion of gas molecules is more than just a mere uh, superficial resemblance. Not just a formal analogy, but something richer, something physical, something in the world. And Gibbs says the same when he says, we may confidently believe, confidently believe that nothing will more conduce to the clear apprehension of the relation of thermodynamics to rational mechanics or static, uh, and to the interpretation of observed uh, phenomena with reference to the evidence respecting the molecular constitutions of the bodies then the study of the fundamental notions or principles of that department of mechanics to which thermodynamics is especially related, which is again statistical mechanics. So we want to connect, we want to explain how statistical mechanics connects to thermodynamics and you know want to provide a sort of a molecular underpinning of thermodynamics. And the search for an appropriate physical interpretation of the world or uh, observed phenomena which connects thermodynamical, uh, th thermodynamics to step map was a prime focus, as you can see, uh, of both Gibbs and Boltzmann. Even though their methods differed significantly, though, you know, how much they differ is a matter of a debate, right? Uh, for example, Wayne Margot might say that, uh, Wayne Margot might say that, uh, you know, these two uh, are really more alike than we think, and a lot of uh, Gibson stuff is just a continuation of uh, uh, Boltzmannian thought. So, of course, all these approaches face their own problems, face their own debates, Gibbs and how they interpret these as ensembles, uh, the role of ergodicity, how they interpret the probabilities provided by the approach. But in contrast, uh, uh, James comes in here and he intro explicitly introduces the notion of subjective statistical mechanics, where the usual rules of step map can be justified independently of any physical argument, independent of experimental verification. So it's like a prior I think, or at least something close to a prior. So he just makes two major claims here, which I'll summarize. Uh, one is subjectivism, and the other is next end. Firstly, the subjective uh, thought is to treat probabilities as an expression of uh, human ignorance or uncertainty. The probability of an event is merely a formal expression of our expectation that the event will or did occur based on whatever information is available. And you interpret the role, the density, uh, probability densities, as a degree of, of what the states might be. 
And the second is a claim about information and maximum entropy. Yeah, the Gibbs entropy can be interpreted as uncertainty contained in rho. So rho on rho is uncertainty of the amount of uncertainty in the rho. It's always maximized on a prior grounds uh, after accounting for physical constraints to reflect our maximal ignorance about the system. So given some constraints, uh, then we uh, plug in max n, we maximize the ignorance, and then we get distributions that uh, uh, approximate what we want. So the question here, given the problem situation I've set up, do James's claims uh, solve the issues faced by this sort of Gibson or Boltzmannian problem situation? And do they provide clear understanding of the issues above or merely obfuscate the issues at hand? So let's start from the uh, lens of superfluidity. So recall the criterion, which is that the generalization of a concept uh, to new domains without justification is superfluous and only adds unnecessary terminology, potential formulas, and confusion. So this may often be irrelevant to or ignores the problem situation. So here I want to say that James's claim are superfluous in three ways. Firstly, the discussion of uh, subjectivism and objectivism about probabilities is entirely irrelevant to the actual second claim about information and maximum entropy. So as a mathematical tool for shortcutting calculations and making predictions. He seems to think that subjectivism is necessary for the information theoretic claim. The first claim is like sort of fundamental for the second. But I think I submit that uh, information is neutral between interpretations. Uh, however, the occurrence of some subjective sounding names, like surprise, information, in the sense that you could inform someone, uncertainty and knowledge could certainly confuse. But I don't think that it forces you to take uh, any stance on the interpretation of probability, which is a metaphysical question to some extent. Right? And why should it? Information theory is an extremely useful tool for everyday communications without explicit metaphysical import. The distinction between objective and subjective interpretations of probability, on the contrary, is a metaphysical one. As Jane notes himself, right, the theories of objective and subjective probabilities are mathematically identical, even though they differ conceptually. So looking at its use in communication, for example, the relevant distributions are typically just distributions of letters, words, and so on. Objective stuff, frequencies, not degrees of belief, at least not on the face of it. Right? Yeah. And information at next end does not force subjectivism on us. So it's kind of irre irrelevant to bring in subjectivism if what you're trying to propose is just a shortcutting tool. And secondly, he thinks that objectivism requires uh, arbitrary assumptions, but it's unclear that subjectivism avoids the same charge. For example, he says subjectivist proposal avoids arbitrary assumptions of physical hypotheses several times. So why should we firstly avoid physical hypotheses in a, in a you know, field we call physics? Right. So that's at least the first thought. Right? For example, ergodicity as a physical hypothesis might have its own conceptual issues and limits of the applicability and so on, as some we have worked on in this room. Right? Uh, but surely it's a valid hypothesis to be considered and debated about whether you know, it does apply to real systems, rather than dismiss a priori you know, one ends up doing with the Jameson approach. This ends up being just as arbitrary. Why do you think that this, you should just give it up? Right? At the very least, an objectivist interpretation makes a claim about the system's actual behavior and why it fits the predictions we make about it in our theory. On the subjectivist proposal, the theory of statistical mechanics is not about describing the dynamics of chances or events occurring on phase space, but merely our degrees of belief about those events happening. So people hate this quote, but I just like to quote it just to you know. Can someone seriously think that our merely being ignorant of the exact microconditions of thermodynamic systems plays some part in bringing it about or making it the case that, say, milk dissolves in coffee? How could that be? What could all these guys have been up to? Right. So I think just a, it, obviously I don't. Uh, I think you will hate this quote because it's so hyperbolic. But I think it gets a point across that there is something weird about this, uh, like the idea that knowledge affects the dynamics of a system or like has something to do with the dynamics of a system. Now, James's paper does not actually appear to be. Uh, oh, this is the point. Sorry. So that's the second point about the arbitrariness of uh, the subjectivist approach, just like the objectivist approach. Uh, and thirdly, James's paper does not actually appear to be about interpretation at all. So he makes it sound like it's about interpretation, right? Information. We are interpreting statistical mechanics in an information theoretic way. But when you read it, uh, when I read it, right, I found that you know the question of interpreting probabilities really does not even arise. Uh, despite appearance to the contrary, right? First, because max n is a proposal concerning convenient predictions and uh, computation. So, although the principle of max entropy uh, appears capable of handling most of the prediction problems of StatMac, it is to be noted that prediction is only one of the functions of StatMac. Equally important is the problem of interpretation, 
given a certain observed behavior of the system, what conclusions can we call, uh, draw as to the microscopic causes of that behavior? To treat this problem and others like it, a different theory, not the one he's talking about, it's a completely different theory, uh, we may call objective statistical mechanics is needed. So this, this suggests that what he was talking about in this whole paper is not about interpretation at all, because he says, well, you know, I'm talking about subjective statement here, and this is objective statement. If you want to care about interpretation, you can do the objective stuff. If you want to do prediction, you can uh, use the set subjective stuff. Right, and they say in the problem of interpretation, one will of course consider the super probabilities of different states in the objective sense. For example, the probability of state uh, n is a fraction of time that the system spends in state n. So it's kind of similar to like the ergodic uh, hypothesis. Right, so Jane's take on the interpretation of uh, probabilities about the actual physical system appears to be uh, objective one in the end. Right, something about the actual states of the system and with the probabilities put in. Right, and one seeming adopted <laughs> some of the ergodic hypothesis came that as true. So. It seems to me that interpreting probabilities and discussion about subjectivism and objectivism is simply irrelevant to the actual goal of the paper. It's just a computational tool for generating predictions, and for that, it's perfect. Furthermore, since we are not tackling the actual issue of how to interpret the probabilities assigned to the states of these actual systems, the max n package is not even relevant to the original problem situation as I've set it up. Right? Uh, and in other words, the existence of providing an information theoretic interpretation of entropy, replacing the previous thermodynamic physical interpretation, uh, it's simply unjustified because the maxn proposal has no real need for interpretation and does not really propose an interpretation. The mere fact, as he says, uh, that the same expression appears both in StatMag and in information theory does not establish any connection. So he says, in this, uh, in this explicitly, he says, we suggest a reinterpretation of StatMag which accomplishes this so that uh, stat information theory can be applied to the problem of justification of StatMag. But it turns out he's not really doing it at all, despite what he says he's doing. You know, information theory is not ultimately applied to the justification of StatMac. That project requires interpreting StatMac and the metaphysics within it about whether swarms or particles can actually recover macroscopic descriptions. And with the remaining time, let me just talk about authoritarianism really quickly. All right, so recall the second criteria of my framework that authoritarians uh, introduce new concepts in the line of inquiry without justification in a dogmatic fashion while ignoring the problem situation and heuristics which led us to those concepts. So I argue that uh, his claims are authoritarian in three ways. Right? Uh, he proclaims that in freeing StatMag from its apparent de dependence on physical hypotheses, we make it possible to see StatMag in a much more general light. And throughout the paper, he insists that the subjectivist approach is necessary for approaching the prediction issue. <laughs> now, firstly, this, uh, this aversion to physical hypotheses is kind of unexplained. He never really says why. He kind of hints at it, but doesn't really say. It does not answer why we need to free statistical mechanics from physical hypotheses. Right? We're doing physics, so on the face of it, it seems kind of weird. And it's clear that he believes that these hypotheses are undesirable. Spend some time claiming, for example, ergodicity or metric transitivity is not needed if we adopt the next end principle. But he notices why we should not adopt physical hypotheses about systems we're studying, and what's wrong with that. He focuses instead on how max n can uh, help us do away with these hypotheses, but it's not, it's not clear that it does. It just shifts our attention away from whether those hypotheses hold. Right? He knows, for example, that adopting max n is like adopting ergodicity, except for our, of our own degrees of belief about the system's behavior rather than actual uh, system's behavior. Right. So he says, for example, that in our effects on our ultimate predictions, this fact is equivalent to an ergodic hypothesis, independently of whether physical systems are in fact ergodic. Now, the system, but then there's further question: you know, Is the system really ergodic, and is ergodicity needed to derive equations concerning those systems' beliefs, uh, behaviors? So either you say nothing at all, and you say, well, that's not my question. I, all I care about is interpretation of uh, my knowledge over my system, uh, degrees of beliefs over the system. Or the max end, you can say, the max end tells, uh, proposal tells me you should have degrees of belief matching the situation where the situ system is ergodic, as the code suggests. But that means I ought to believe that the system is ergodic after all. So I believe the physical hypothesis of ergodicity. But that's the original issue. Right. We want to know whether ergodicity is necessary for StatMax systems to behave in accordance with our uh, thermodynamical observations. So either makes sense is irrelevant to our problem situation or it adds nothing new. He don't take the role of interpretation again and focus on prediction and information without reason while completing the two at some times. So I think this is uh, authoritarian because the founders of StatMax were clearly concerned first and foremost with the interpretive issues, maybe not the only concerns, but these were their main concerns how we connect particles to about microscopic behavior. And this is not to say that prediction has no role to play at all in StatMag, but it's strange to ignore the other half 
as he does here while claiming that he's doing exactly that interpretation uh, issue. So in this respect, his paper is authoritarian. It ignores the problem situation of step back, such as the importance of uh, interpretive issues. And finally, the overall introduction of information theoretic concepts and the shift of step back as a general tool of inference uh, is authoritarian in the sense that he offers no reason for adopting that information theory. We are told that Gibbs entropy can be interpreted as the shared entropy as information, and that development of information theory has been felt by many people to be of big significance for step back. But it never says why. So in the paper itself is authoritarian. Right? We are, we're not told why statement should be a general tool of statistical inference, free from physics, where the usual rules are justified independently of physical arguments and of experimental verification. Right? So overall then the verdict, for, for, on my view, right, uh, James's proposal is degenerate with respect to this thing called depth that I didn't really catch out, but method is a degenerate with respect to its methodology. So for example, Meckenstein again, a mere 20 years after, right, uh, is escape from subjective step to objective step -neck. So this still had gotten blurred just 20 years from there. With thermodynamic entropy being interpreted directly as ignorance or uncertainty. And like I said earlier, for example, three years later, Hawking will simply assert that intimate connections between black holes or white holes. Uh, and thermodynamic arises because information is lost down the hole. So we are talking about physical objects here, but we are sort of like mixing up our information theory stuff and our real world objective physical stuff. So degeneration has occurred in my view. So thank you for your time. Please feel free to ask questions.